come on up and I'll, I'll um, have you pray for Pastor Joshua. Well, Lord, we do just lift up Joshua to you. We know that um, you love him, you love his wife, and you love their baby. We pray, God, that you would pour out grace and mercy on him and on her and on their extended family. This is a, a very, very tragic time in all sorts of ways, and it's so much harder because they are not able to be together in the way that they want to. And so we just pray, Lord, that in your grace and your mercy, you would be present to them in their grief, but also, God, that you would provide a way for her to come here, to be with Yahshua and to make a home here. We pray, God, that as a church, we would be able to extend some small measure of practical assistance, but also that that would be uh, just your grace and your mercy to them and that it would encourage them in some small way. And we pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gail. Well, uh, <laughs> on that note, we're, we're jumping into or back into uh, the Gospel of Luke, which Pastor Gail, Pastor Gail took, the, took the initiative to, to launch us into with Luke 15 last week. Uh, and we're going to be back in Luke 15 again this week. Um, but I wanted to start with, um, so I, I, I heard the, the great joke that you told. <laughs> I won't repeat it. It was, it was uh, what's, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It was funny. It made me laugh, but it also made me groan a little bit, whatever, you know, you know jokes like that, which I think that's kind of what you're aiming for in, in church, right, when you tell jokes in church. But uh, I decided I would throw up next slide. Um, this is actually a Dilbert cartoon, which well, I'll let you read it. Right, exactly. So you have failed to meet a goal set by our... So Dilbert is meeting with his boss. You have failed to meet a goal set by our CEO. And Dilbert asks, do you mean the impossible goal, the ill-advised one, or the one you didn't tell me about? And then he goes home and tells his pet, I figured out what's wrong with the world uh, or what's wrong with life. It's other people, right? I was, I was actually talking with my daughter. In, in my opinion, there is the best comic ever. Then there's kind of like one that's okay, and then there's everything else. Unfortunately, Dilbert's in the everything else category. So my favorite comic ever, like hands down, the only one that is Calvin and Hobbes. Like this is like, they're, they're just there is there is no other comic that comes even close to Calvin and Hobbes. And then the Far Side is a distant second, <laughs> distant second. And then everything else doesn't even really count in my book. That's it. So if you guys, you know, if you have comics that you actually think could cut the mustard, you can share them with me, Dilbert. I think as I've gotten older, I've at least come to appreciate Dilbert and the insight that it has into life. Um, anyway, so I thought I would share this with you because Dilbert is dealing with a boss who is um, incompetent, evil, foolish, all of the above, right? And that's kind of like the, the, the running theme throughout Dilbert. And um, hopefully that is not how we feel about God. Uh, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna chew on that a little bit. Um, just the, what, it, what it means for us to interact with God as somebody who is giving us direction for life. Um, so uh, you, can, you can put up the next slide. So last week, Gail jumped into... Um, yes, that's right. You, so if you weren't here last week, you didn't see this. This is The Lost Sheep. Uh, we'll also be talking about the lost coin, and today we're going to be digging into the lost son, the parable of the lost son, right? So Pastor Gail took uh, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. I'll be digging into the parable of, of the lost son today. But all three of these are really, they, they're a whole, right? And they actually come, Jesus teaches all three of these as a response to a specific situation, which we'll get into um, as we continue on this morning. But the, the, the parable of the lost sheep, right? So the, the point behind the sheep is this is what happens when a sheep gets lost and doesn't have the care that it needs, um, is bad things can happen, right? And so uh, the, the, the parable of the, the lost sheep, really, there's, there's a lot of things we could dig into there. And, and Pastor Gail shared some of these things about the way that God protects and provides and what happens when we step out from under the provision and protection of God, but Jesus makes clear at the end of the parable what the point of the parable is. 
He actually shares the main point. And it's right for us to dig into the details of the parable and pull out as much meat as possible and understand what it means. But Jesus makes clear to us what the main point is, right? Uh, you can throw up the next slide. So this is, again, from last week, Pastor Gail's picture that she used to talk about the parable of the lost coin, right? And again, we can geek out on, you know, first century Palestinian economic realities or like what it's like to be a woman in, you know, Jewish culture in first century. And all of that is relevant to like understand the story and understand the parable. But again, Jesus actually makes really clear what the main point of the parable is when he tells this story and it's recorded in Luke's gospel. Uh, and so you can throw up the next slide. Um, so we're going to talk today and we're going to read the parable of the lost son. And I, I thought it was uh, helpful. I have no idea how, um, like, the, the relationship between the word parable and the word parabola, <laughs> I don't know if there's, like, an actual, like, etymological relationship there or what the, what the link is. Again, I know there's some word history connections there. I do know that... Uh, when Jesus taught in parables, it didn't have anything to do with math. So, like, I get that. But in my head, that link has helped me to understand what Jesus is doing with these parables, right? So, if you know, how many of you guys don't know what a parabola is? Just so I have a, there's a few people. Okay, all right. So, so I, don't have to, I don't have to take too much time to explain. But if you've seen a, the graph of a parabola, right, it's like goes in an arc or it could go this way or it could, you know, there's a lot of different ways. But the basic idea is it's like a U-shape or an upside down U shape, right? And what you see is, if you gr on a graph, if you graph the Y axis, the numbers go up and come back down. If you graph the X axis, they're going along a line, right? And the way that I've thought about that is that what Jesus is doing in these parables is he's, he's in a situation where people are thinking or talking or acting in a certain way. And what he does is he kind of steps away from that situation into something else and then comes back to that situation in a way that actually moves somebody along the line. Does that make sense? And so that's the way that I've like thought, and again, I have no idea if, <laughs> if there's any like <laughs> linguistic reason for me to think that way, but it's really helped me to think, oh, okay. So what Jesus is doing is he's interacting with these Pharisees and they have some ideas about God and about themselves and what it means to, to live as faithful Jewish people. And so he's stepping away from that into kind of this hypothetical story that he's telling. And in this case, it's three different stories. And then he's coming back to them, hopefully in a way that has moved them along the line a little bit, right? That's the point. And, you know, you can see oftentimes when Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees, sometimes he's trying and hoping to move them, but oftentimes he's using them as a prop for the people that are standing around watching. He's, he's taking what the Pharisees are saying, and he's using that to help his disciples or the crowds understand what truth faithfulness looks like. And that's very much what's going on in these stories. And as we dig into the, um, the parable of the prodigal son today and we reflect on uh, the parable of the, the lost sheep and the lost coin, we will, we will see um, exactly what it is that Jesus is trying to do, what he's trying to teach, what he's trying to explain, why he's sharing these, these stories, these parables, right? So we are in Luke chapter 15. You guys can turn there with me if you want or you can just listen as I read. Uh, let's see, we're in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus continued, right? So he's continuing to talk. He's taught about, uh, he's told the story of the, the lost sheep. He's told the story of the lost coin. And now he's telling this story. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. 
So he got up and he went to his father. But while he, was a still, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and he pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So this is our, our passage for today. Super common passage. I would imagine if you've hung out in church at all, you've heard this story read about and talked about and taught about um, for obvious reason, right? This is one of these places in Scripture, one of the stories in Scripture that really captures the heart of God in a way that captures our imaginations and captures our hearts and speaks to us, right? And so I know Pastor Gail had, had shared last week just the, the big idea that like God, God, I'm not going to say it in the words that, that she used, and you can correct me if you want to, but just that like God loves to welcome people in to his, into relationship with him. It's, it's what he loves. You, you want to, you, do you ever have the phrase memorized? Relentless pursuit, right, was the phrase that she used. And like this, th this speaks to that. This story communicates that to us. And I actually, you guys want to hear a story of what happened to me this morning? <laughs> right? So this morning, so whenever Tammy is out of town um, or is at work, it's, it's my job slash opportunity for me to walk our dog. And he gets like a 90-minute walk in the morning. So it's like a legit walk, right? And he's got a, a route that he goes on. And if you don't take him on that route, you have to fight him to get him to go somewhere else because that's the route that Tammy takes him on. Anyway, so I took him down to the waterfront. And you know that there's that, I don't know what you call it. It's not a pier. It's like a causeway or whatever that goes out along in between the river and the canal. And so I like to uh, take him there and turn him off of his leash because he can't really go anywhere, right? And he likes to run. And uh, so went out there, took him off his leash. We were going, and on our way back, he ended up um, attacking somebody's dog. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy was like kicking him to get him off. And I'm there thinking like, he kind of deserved it. You shouldn't be attacking people's dogs. But am I going to end up getting into a fist fight with some guy on Sunday morning on my way home to church? Like what is, ended up everything worked out just fine. I apologize to the guy for letting him off. He didn't kick Jupiter, the dog, our dog's name. He didn't kick Jupiter that hard. It was like a well-deserved kick and he, he ran away. Um, Anyway, I share all that story. The point of the story is not that I almost got into a fist fight this morning, which I actually didn't almost get into a fist fight this morning. But the point of the story is, like, in the, like, 60 seconds after I had released Jupiter from the leash before he picked a fight with a, a random dog, I was reflecting on how much I love turning him loose. Like, I really like doing it. It's, it's actually a great joy to me to take this... I mean, he's a, he's a husky, right, who loves to run... And I feel kind of guilty about having him in the city and having him on a leash. And so I really like it when I get to cut him loose and say, all right, go, go have fun. And he takes off running. And it's, it, it gives me a lot of joy to do that. And I share all of that with you because you, like, maybe that's not a particular joy that you have, but you can imagine yourself in that story. And there are things like that for you where... You just get a lot of joy out of it, whether it's serving somebody in some particular way. Some of you guys love hospitality. You love cooking and having people show up and just feel well cared for and fed and, you know, other people. You, you like to serve people in different ways, and, and, but you, you can imagine that, whatever that is for you, what that feels like, right? And I share that with you because 
like these stories capture something of God's heart, right? They capture some of God's joy towards us. And, and it says specifically in these stories what it is, like why Jesus is telling these stories. He, he, he shares it with us, and it's because they communicate something of the joy of God himself, right? In the, in, at the tail end of both parables, the, the, the lost coin and the lost sheep, um, Jesus says, after the, the parable of the lost sheep, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 who did not need to repent. Like God has joy in his heart when people come to him. When people who are far away come back, he just loves it. He loves it, right? And Jesus says the same thing, right? Right? Uh, this, is, this is after the, the parable of the lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Like Jesus is making clear why he's telling these stories. is because he wants us to understand what gives God joy. What God enjoys doing, what makes him happy, what gets him excited, what he loves. He's telling these stories so that we get that. But, but there's also, and here's where that like parabolic arc comes in, right? He's, he's also in, like there's something going on that causes him to tell these stories, right? So in verse 15, I'm sorry, in verse 1 of chapter 15, what sets off these parables in the first place, we read, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And this is why Jesus tells these three parables, right? So he's, he wants to communicate to the Pharisees, but also to his disciples and to the crowd of people listening. These Pharisees, they have their vision of what it looks like to be a godly person. Let me tell you about God. Let me tell you what gets God excited and what brings joy to God's heart. Because this vision of what it looks like to be godly couldn't be more wrong, right? And so this, the, the parable of the prodigal son, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of a masterful, uh, it's a masterful parable because Jesus starts off with a pretty powerful hook, right? So if you know a little bit about this parable or about uh, Jewish culture and custom at the time, the fact that the younger son would go to his father and say, I want, I want my inheritance now, when really he didn't actually even get an inheritance, right? That was, that was supposed to be for the older son, and it also was supposed to come after his father had passed away, right? So he's basically saying to his dad, I don't really, I wish you were dead, I want my money now, right? So incredibly selfish, shameful act is how we set the scene. So of course the Pharisees are like, yeah, that, that guy's bad, really, really bad, shame on him, right? Which everybody in the culture would have responded with that. And then this guy takes the money and flees and wastes it on sinful activities, right? And ends up, again, I'm sure you guys have heard, heard this point made before, ends up wishing he could eat what he's feeding the pigs, which if you're a Jewish person, you don't want to hang out with pigs. You definitely don't want to eat what they're eating. You want to stay away from them. They're not clean. And everybody's kind of like, yeah, he got what he deserved. Good for him, right? So this is the beginning of this parable. And Jesus sets the hook with this story in a way that everybody in the culture would have said, yeah, yeah, jerk of a son, got what he deserved. Then he remembers, you know what, my dad is actually a good boss. Maybe I'll just go ask him to be my boss. And he goes back, and the father responds with incredible mercy in a way that I don't think anybody in the crowd, including the Pharisees, could help but respond with, yeah, I guess if my son did that to me and then he returned, I'd still want to take him back. It's my kid. Right? And so Jesus, again, masterfully sets the hook and moves the story along to say, yeah, like, of course, if you have children who have done horrible, shameful things, you still, as a father, want to be merciful towards them and welcome them back in. And then he introduces the older brother <laughs> to the story. And the older brother responds not with, wow, my brother's back. 
but instead judgment towards the Father for his mercy. How dare you, Dad? I've been slaving away for you. Where is my money? Is the response of the older brother. And Jesus is setting the Pharisees' judgment towards Jesus and judgment toward the people that Jesus is hanging out with in the context of this story. Okay, older son, you claim to love your father so much, and yet really when push comes to shove, all you really care about is money too. You didn't care about your time spent with your father. You're not caring about the things that, even if you don't love your own brother, maybe you didn't like him in the first place, but your father who you claim to you know, serve and care about, he loves your brother. How come you don't care about the things your father cares about? Right? And Jesus is telling this story to at least move the crowds, but hopefully move the Pharisees from this place of judgment to a place of really soft heartedness and repentance, right? And so this is what Jesus is doing with this parable. And I think the main point in all of this is, uh, yeah, you know, we can, we can throw up the next slide. Um, <laughs> sports metaphors for all you guys who like sports. Um, I, I got to tell a story about baseball or about t-ball, and then I'll explain the main point of, of our message this morning. So um, my brother, uh, who my brother was a fantastic baseball player. He actually, he injured his elbow when he was a freshman in high school. Otherwise, I mean, he would have, he would have, he, he was playing in eighth grade on a U21 team. I mean, very, very good baseball player. But then he blew out his elbow and that was the end of his career. Anyway, at the age of five, he wasn't so good of a baseball player. <laughs> because, so he was probably the most athletic kid on the team. He could hit the ball the farthest, he could run the fastest. But he had this habit of hitting the ball and running to second base. Which if you know anything about baseball, you're supposed to go to second base after you go to first base, right? So you hit the ball, run to first base. And he used to drive my dad insane, who was our coach when we were on the t-ball team, right? Because <laughs> it's like all season long, all t-ball season, whatever, 20 games, hit the ball, run to second base, hit the ball, run to second base. Again, hit the ball the farthest, run the fastest, you're out, right? And the point of that story is, and, you know, there's some pretty funny uh, examples of things like this happening, even at, like, the professional sports level where somebody scores a goal against their own team in soccer or, you know, like these things, they don't happen often, but they do happen. And the point is, you can be the most athletic person on your team and not only not help your team, but hurt your team if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish. Does that make sense, right? And I think th that is what is going on. That, like these Pharisees, they were incredibly disciplined, incredibly committed, incredibly sacrificial, and they were marching in exactly the wrong direction, right? And this is what Jesus is pointing at. Hey, that's great that you're sacrificial. That's great that you tithe out of your mint. Good job. How about you love your neighbor? Because that's the point, right? And so this is exactly what Jesus is doing with these Pharisees. Is He's saying, hey, you, you guys, you got, you got a lot of things going for you. You can hit the ball the farthest and you can run the fastest. I sure wish you knew how to run to first base. Right? This is what Jesus is doing with the Pharisees. And so the, the, the point here is that it is easy for us in our religious fervor to miss the point. Right? It's easy for us to be people who can lose sight of what matters to God if we don't keep the main thing the main thing. Right? And again, the, I, I think that in all of the different groups that were running around first century Palestine, the Pharisees are the ones that Jesus was constantly butting heads with. And I actually think it's because they were the ones who were the closest, not the farthest away, from God's heart. Right? They, they, they really were good athletes. They had the potential to be great baseball players. If only they could just figure out that you run to first after you hit the ball, they really could do this thing. And you see, like, there are some Pharisees who become followers of Christ, right? Um, because these are people who, in many ways, they had theology that would align with the theology of, of the New Testament and of Jesus and of, of the Old Testament. Like, there was a lot of things about the Pharisees that I think Jesus would affirm. And yet, so often, their hearts were in the wrong place. And this is the place that Jesus keeps pointing to again and again and again when he interacts with the Pharisees. And that's exactly what's going on here. So, um, yeah, we'll move on to the next slide. I had a whole other passage of Scripture, and, but we're, we're just going to move, move forward. I just looked at the clock. Uh, right. So I was trying to find uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I was tr trying to find like pictures to like commute, and th I had to use this one because of the pinky. Uh, the pinky. I was like, all right, I got to use this. This is it. This is the pinky, right? Because, <laughs> and I don't know what these guys are drinking. I don't know who they are. I don't. Maybe they're all three of them really good guys. You know, I don't know. It's just a picture I found on the internet. But that pinky sold me, right? Because I mean, I don't know. You know. And again, may, I don't know. Maybe you're supposed to do that. I know. In some like that's when I was a kid. It was always like you drink tea with your pinky out to be like British and fancy, and you know. No idea if that's a real thing or not, but I, I'm going with it. Anyway, the point here is, it's a silly example, but I think it, it drives the point home, right? What are we paying attention to? What are the markers of godliness? What are the markers of you know, fruitfulness in the kingdom? Or how do we define what it means to be good or successful or whatever language you want to use? Like, what, what does God care about, right? In, in these stories, Jesus is making really clear that what God cares about is people whose hearts are soft towards him and people who are coming back to him and people who are receiving from him. That, this is the thing that God cares about. And the Pharisees are caring about the wrong things. They're, hey, how many pinky, you know, does everybody have their pinky out? We all doing it the right way, right? Is everybody drinking their, their tea or their, their wine or their champagne with their pinky out? Because this is what matters, Right? And again, silly example, but we've probably all engaged in those kinds of things in our lives. Um, I, I remember it's, this is like one of the most powerful, like, I don't know, experiences that I had with God in my life. It, 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 there, like, there's so many things that are connected to it, just in terms of God being present to me and being in the midst of a community of people that I cared about and even some of the specific people involved and lessons that God has taught to me. But I was, um, this was the, the church in Northern California that I was a part of. I don't remember if this was early on or if I was already one of the pastors there, but I, there was this moment where um, Pastor Mike, the senior pastor, had been the worship leader off and on a couple of times and then had had other people step in and lead worship as well. Uh, and then um, we had a worship leader who got sent to be a part of a church planning team, and there wasn't really anybody to step into that role. So Pastor Mike, it was kind of like, well, Pastor Mike could step back in and be the worship leader again. Or there was this other guy, Joe, who was a very talented guitar player, but he couldn't really sing. <laughs> I was like, well, we could let Joe do it, <laughs> right? And, uh, and like, you have to understand that Pastor Mike, one of the things that I heard him say again and again and again is as, as Christian leaders, as pastors, our success is going to be determined by our successors, right? We're not judged a success in God's eyes based on what we accomplish, but rather based on how much we invest in other people and they grow and become the people that God wants them to be. This, and and I, I'm sharing this story to make that point, but also to communicate to you how powerfully Pastor Mike was committed to this in sacrificial ways, right? So Joe's going to be the worship leader, and the church, I mean, the number of times that he started songs in one key on the guitar and in another key in his voice, which that's as bad as it gets. If you know anything about music, like I have, I've pulled a couple of doozies when I was leading worship. I've never been that bad, right? <laughs> Joe was not a good singer. They got him singing lessons. It only, the experiment had lasted like six months. That was all it lasted, right? Um, but people left the church over it. Yeah, I can't. I can't deal with this. It's crazy. Like, I thought, how are we supposed to, you know, sing to Jesus, right? But this was the commitment of our pastor, and because it was the commitment of our pastor, and he was leading us in this. And again, like, there's a value for singing in key, right? I was just say that from the front end. But also, it's like, all right, what are we doing here? What is the point of church? Why are we here, right? And I remember it was a, a Sunday that I was supposed to to do like kind of the vision and announcements at the church, and Joe is leading worship. I still remember the song. It's actually a song that's really meaningful to me because of this moment, but it's uh, Surely Goodness and Mercy. It's kind of like a version of Psalm 23 that Derek Green wrote. Um, and uh, I, am, I lost it. I was bawling precisely because Joe was up there leading our congregation in just this song declaring how good God is to us, right? And I mean, I don't know. I don't even un understand all of the emotions connected to it or why, but I, I lost my composure so bad that I actually had to leave the room and go outside to try and recover my emotional, like, 
wherewithal so that I could do, do announcements, and I couldn't. I had to tell one of the other pastors, you're just going to have to go up there. I can't do it. I just had completely lost it. And because there was something so powerful about Joe stepping in and doing something, he was just trying to serve. And he knew he was not a good, like he was very well aware of what he was and wasn't capable of. But it was this decision as a church to say, hey, like we're going to invest in this man and we're going to make the point that we're a community who wants to celebrate Jesus in our lives. It's not about how good our lead singer is at singing songs. That's not the point. And somehow in all of that was something so powerful for me. And I share all of that to say, like, how many times in our lives as Christians can we run around counting pinkies? Has everybody got their pinky out? Are we doing it just right? And it's just not the point. It's not the point at all. And so we have to be able to identify those places where it's, it's like, who is in charge here? What are we aiming at? Are we like Dilbert, who's like, yeah, that boss is stupid, doesn't know what he's talking about, and maybe Dilbert's boss really doesn't know what he's talking about? But I would beg to say that God actually does know what he's talking about, and when he gives us advice, <laughs> that it's actually good advice. When he says, hey, it's, it's, it's actually mercy that we should be leaning into, right? It's not being so caught up in some of these other religious, again, tithe your mint, go ahead, do it. That's important. Please don't be addicted to pornography. Please don't lie, cheat, and steal. Like, yeah, of course, like all of that matters. But at the end of the day, what God cares about is that we would be people who are coming back to him, have soft hearts towards him. And when we see people around us who in all of their brokenness and shame and misery are saying, I just want Jesus, man, should we celebrate that. Man, should we get excited about that. That should be the thing that we, we want to tell stories about and we want to throw parties over, right? So last slide here. I think when it comes to what, like, what, is it, what does this mean practically for us? I mean, I think that there, like, we have to be people who've made a conscious decision about where we're going to get our marching orders, right? And hopefully we're all in the room because we've made that kind of a conscious decision. But I would encourage you to continue to make that conscious decision, to be aware of the ways that we can get caught up in counting the wrong things or having the wrong goals or dreaming about the wrong things or worshiping the wrong heroes, right? Th those are things that they will tempt us over the course of our whole lives. And we should pay attention to that. And again and again, the word is Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, right? But when it comes to practically what we should do, I think, um, well, like I said, I, I, shared, I shared with you that story about Pastor Mike and Joe, the worship leader, because Pastor Mike in particular, and then his leadership for our church, the rest of us, we really did try and, like, make sure that we knew what the, goal, the goals were, right? So we were trying to dream about the right things, right? And so it begs the question, what are we dreaming about? And like really, I mean, it, that would be a good, a good thing to write down. What are the things that I hope for, dream for, or long to happen? And maybe as you start doing that reflective work, you might realize, oh, I just dream about money all the time. <laughs> or I dream about fame. Or I dream about pleasure. Or I dream about escape. Or I, right? I mean, it wouldn't be abnormal for us to dream about these things. But then to, okay, well, so what would it look like for me to identify the dreams that God has for my life and for our world? What, what should, if I, was, if I was really serious about following Jesus, what would I dream about? I mean, somebody just shared with me a dream this morning about our local government, our local nonprofit community, and our local church all being on the same page together to solve a problem that is facing our city. That would that's a, that'd be a pretty cool, I'd like to see that happen, <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> yeah, I think that's the kind of dreams that we should dream, right? So what are, the, what, are, like, what are the dreams that we should have? What are the plans that we should make? How are we going to actually make those things happen? And again, as we start reflecting on the plans that we've made and that we are making and where we're spending our time and energy preparing for the future, maybe we'll discover that we're planning for retirement. Again, not that we shouldn't. Please plan for your retirement. But are we planning to accomplish the things that God cares about in our lives? What are the stories that we tell? 
right? I mean, Zach came up here and told a story about uh, an encounter with God that somebody had through an interaction they had with a, a person while they're out shopping, right? What are the story? Do we tell stories about, you know, people being, being wildly successful in sports or, in, or do we tell stories about, you know, God at work in people's lives or people being sacrificial in their, their pursuit of Christ? Or like, what are, you know, what are, the things, what are the things that we celebrate? What are the things that we throw parties over? Right? And so to begin to think about things like that, what, what do I actively dream about? What do I plan for? What do I tell stories about? What do I celebrate? And those are the things that, as God's people, we should be doing, right? Try, try identifying a place in your life where you have seen God at work and then just telling that story to people. See what happens, Right? Identify a place in somebody else's life where you just have seen God at work and like celebrate it with them. Think about the kinds of things that you think God would dream about in your family or in our city or in our world or in your own life or in your school or whatever and like share that with people. Man, I think this would be, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? Right, and so the, this is, if we're gonna be people who are paying attention to the things that God cares about and caring about the things that God cares about, that's, that's, the, kind of, that's the kind of stuff we're going to be doing. Does that make sense? All right. So we're going to take communion together. You can put the last slide up. Uh, this is actually uh, Rembrandt's the, the Prodigal Son, pretty famous painting. And I think I just want to come back to that idea that what God longs for is soft hearts towards him. Right? And I think that that is that's really captured in this this um, painting, but also in the story of the, the prodigal son. Uh, that's right. This is, it's, it's Matthew 13, but it's actually Jesus quoting um, from Isaiah. And he's, he's actually even, you know, his, his disciples are like, why do you always talk in parables? And this is his response, right? He says, um, uh, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. And so again, what Jesus is saying here is, be people who are longing to hear from God, who are longing to see God, who have hearts that just want to hear from him, that want to receive from him. And this is the point. Sure, all that other stuff matters, but you know what? All that other stuff will come if our hearts are receptive towards God, if we have soft hearts soft hearts towards God. And this is, this is it. And so like this act of communion really is our way of saying to God, of declaring to God, you're God. I am not. You have life to give. I want it. You have salvation to offer. I need it. And I'm coming to consume the food that is your body and your blood, the life that you have in you that you want to share with me. That's, that's what communion is. It's our declaration of that posture towards God in a, like a physical communal way to say, yep, that's what I'm signing up for with my life. So I'm gonna invite you guys to come up here in a second and take the, the oh yeah, I was gonna say, oh no, we don't have any bread, but it's covered. <laughs> so I'll uncover it, but I'm gonna invite you guys to come up and take the bread and the juice. Uh, and return to your seats, and then I'll lead us in communion. But maybe there's something this morning that God has put his finger on in you. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's like some temptation or some challenge or some place where you want to say to God, all right, like I'm rejecting this or I'm embracing that or for me to really truly say to you, I have a soft heart towards you. I know that it demands this of me. And so if there's something that God is putting his finger on this morning, talk to God about it right now. As, as you're coming forward, as we're preparing for communion, ask God to speak to you, ask God to heal you, ask God to move you, um, offer your repentance towards him in whatever way that, that is meaningful. Does that make sense? So why don't you guys come up and take the bread and the juice and return to your seats.
deeper and darker But your love never changes Lord, you're so gracious And if I run back home God, you come running But your love never changes Lord, you're so gracious with a kiss, with a ring and a rope. You have found me. You have found me. With a kiss, with a ring and a rope. You have found me. You have found me. I could let you down over and over, but your love never changes. Lord, you're so patient, and if I run back home, God, you come running, because your love never changes. Lord, you're so gracious. Kiss with a ring and a rope. You have found me. You have found me. With a kiss, with a ring and a rope. You have found me. You have found The night before Jesus was betrayed and arrested and ultimately killed, he had a meal with his friends. And at that meal, he took the bread and he thanked God for it and he broke it and he shared it with his friends and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat this and remember my death. And then he took the, the wine and he shared with his friends, this wine is my blood which is spilled for the new covenant. Well, Lord, we thank you for the life that you offer to us. we thank you that it comes not through our payment or at our expense, but at yours. Amen. So, Taylor, I don't know if there's anything you want to share. Or... Thanks. Um, so we have a, peop a team of people who pray before the service, and their disposition is kind of to listen to God and see if there's anything specific he wants to talk to either individuals about who would be here or, like, our congregation. And this morning, they actually, it was interesting, two people had the same sort of sense from the Lord, and one wasn't in the room, and then came into the room and said it. So we're pressing into it. We think that God wants to speak to some people today um, who have broken relationships in their life uh, that they want healed. Um, the specific word was past woundedness, and, and God wants to bring healing and unity. Um, so if, as I'm saying that, someone's flashing through your head or you're getting some sort of sense inside of you, I would just invite you to um, ask someone to pray with you this morning, or you can raise a hand because I'm looking out and I'll, I'll see you and find someone to pray with you. Um, and then the second thing we're going to do is just... No, you know what? I think that's it. I think that's it this morning. Um, but the, the general idea is that God is here with us right now. He's within us if we're believers. And he wants to do kind of what Pastor Steve was talking about. He wants to speak to us this morning. Um, he wants to show us his love, and, and he does that in real time. So I think um, Jen's just going to play a, another song, 
And if you want prayer, I'd encourage you to stay in the room and either raise your hand or find someone to pray with you. And if you don't want prayer or want to pray with people this morning, I just ask that you either just be kind of quiet and hang or, or leave the room if you want to talk. And we're just going to give a little more space to, to be with God this morning. Cool. Well, I'll read a, I'll read a passage of scripture as a benediction slash introduction to, to what we're going to do. And again, if you guys want prayer, come and get it. If you want to stay and just listen to the music or watch the prayer or just be in a place of reflection yourself, you can. Or if you want to go grab a cup of coffee and fellowship, just go downstairs and do it. Sound good? So this is um, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. The Lord is your shepherd. You lack nothing. He makes you to lie down in green pastures and he leads you beside quiet waters. He refreshes your soul. He guides you along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though you walk through the darkest valley, you will fear no evil for he is with you and his rod and his staff, they comfort you. He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He anoints your head with oil and your cup overflows. And surely his goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.